um, I'm going to talk today about the design brace uh, inference framework. So I was very interested in knowing what was with your background because I wanted to know how familiar you were with this set of tools in the sense of how 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 deep uh, uh, do I need to go or, or whether you require a more like a general uh, understanding. And I think uh, the, the the work that I'm going to do is just to show you in a very general way the tools because you are I doubt you're the persons that are going to actually calculate those uh, specific statistics. So in this section, I'm going to talk about several things. I'm going to make a quick description of how do we estimate things like totals of variables and means of variables in the case of the design based inference framework. I'm going to talk about direct and indirect domain estimation. So if I'm not interested in the total of the country, but I'm interested in now municipalities, departments, groups, of uh, units, then uh, there are different classes of estimators. One of some of them are called direct, and some of them I'm um, calling direct. I'm going to explain you a little bit about that. I'm going to introduce synthetic and composite estimators, which are also different classes of estimators. And then I'm going to talk very briefly about the generalities of design based variance estimation. So, in the first, only the first two parts of this talk would be the equivalent to. Uh, including sampling design, it would be the equivalent to a whole course on, on the survey sampling of one semester uh, at the university. So I'm just going to try to summarize uh, things as much as I can. Uh, clearly, I'm not going to show you the proofs of many of the things that I'm going to that I'm going to say, but I'm going to try to provide you towards the end with a full set of references in case uh, you want to go and check things in more detail. OK. So um, I described briefly what was uh, the design based inference framework. Here I'm going to define it in a bit more detail with a bit more notation. So uh, in the case of the design based inference framework, we start by thinking that the population is a fixed population of elements. So there is a fixed set that are in this case n elements. I'm going to assume that there exist capital N elements. I don't know, 45 million people in Colombia, for instance. So each one of them uh, I could name with one of these indexes and they are fixed. They are not changing. It's not like I'm, I'm, I'm fixed the population in one point in time. I know people die, people is born and so on. In this framework, I'm going to fix that population. I'm going to take a snapshot in, of that population at one time point. OK, so it's a population that is fixed in terms of which units belong to that population. And it's also fixed in the sense of the associate attributes, the variables that I measure for each one of them. Those Ys are uh, fixed, but they are unknown. OK, my interest is to obtain an estimate for a parameter that is a function of those Y values. Here I'm denoting it theta of Y1 up to Yn to indicate that it's a function of those parameters. And I want to estimate that uh, of those of, uh, by values, I'm sorry. And I want to obtain an estimate of that, that parameter after having observed a sample, a random sample of a small n elements that I'm going to denote by S, which is clearly a subset of the whole population of elements U. And uh, that sample is selected using uh, what is called a sampling design that gives uh, that particular S, the sample S, a, a probability P of S. OK, so I'm denoting here by an estimator, my parameter is theta. I'm going to use a hat to indicate that that is an estimator of theta. And I use theta of s just to indicate that that is the estimator of theta that I obtain once I have selected that particular sample s. This uh, capital S is just the possible the set that contains all possible samples for a given sampling design. These things probably are going to come a bit more clear be a bit more clear with, with the examples that I have uh, planned a little in later on. OK, so that theta hat is just an estimator of the parameter that I want to I want to um, estimate theta. Examples of this, um, this situation. So, for example, I can think that my parameter of interest is the overall mean of income. OK, so why? Uh, y1 to yn is going to be the income of each one of the person in the population. And then what I'm interested to know, I'm interested in understanding what is the uh, average income in that population. I can describe that average income as simply the sum over all the elements of the population of the income of each one of those individuals. So I'm using k 
to indicate each one of those individuals, and then I simply divide by the total population size n. One possible estimator that I can think about is just to use the sample mean. So if I selected a sample instead of the universe U, I have a sample S, then I'm going to take those elements that are in S, I'm going to observe their values on the income variable, I'm going to sum those quantities, and then I'm going to divide by how many elements I observed. Okay, so this would be the sample mean, and that would, is a possible, one of many possible estimates estimators for this quantity, for this parameter Y, capital Y bar, okay? Another example, I could be interested in estimating not the average income, but I could estimate the total of Y, for example, and the total income uh, across the whole population. And then in that case, I'm going to introduce two estimators, two of the many possible estimators that I could use. One of them you may have heard uh, this name before. One of them is called the Horvitz Thompson estimator for that total, which I'm indicating here by that subindex HD, that is the Horvitz Thompson one, which consists on taking the sum over the sample of the values that I observed, but each one of them is divided by this quantity PK. So that quantity PK is one. Sorry? So that quantity PK. Pi. <laughs> By this quantity pi k, uh, that quantity pi k is the inclusion probability of that element k. So I said I'm selecting a sample using a sampling design, it's a random sample. So that random sample induces what are called as the inclusion probabilities. Actually, a sampling design is characterized by what are the inclusion probabilities uh, that it induces in that population. So uh, that inclusion probability is calculated as if you imagine that that particular sample had a probability of being selected as a set P of S, then the inclusion probability of individual K, for example, is just going to be the sum over all the possible samples that contain K of the probability of me selecting that sample. That's how I define the inclusion probability. Okay. And then that inclusion probability, I put it here in the denominator. Um, and that's going to be the way how I construct the Horvitz Thompson estimator. Actually, the quantity one over PK is usually called the expansion factor. Um, that involves the inclusion A probability. That was that is one of the possible estimators that I can have for that total. There is another estimator that I can propose for that total. This is called the Hadjik Brewer estimator which works in a similar but a slightly different way. So if you assume that you know the total number of observations in the population, then the Hadjik Brewer estimator for that total uses a Horvitz Thompson estimator here and another Horvitz Thompson estimator here. So what you have here in the numerator, you see is the same thing that I have here. So it's just the Horvitz Thompson estimator for the total of Y, the total income, and I divide by well, now I'm counting how many elements. So actually, this thing that I have in the denominator is the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the size of the population. So I'm using this, uh, this quantity here is basically the same Horvitz Thompson estimator that multiplied by a factor, a factor that has n and n hat, if you would like to, to see it like that. Uh, and that extra quantity is extremely helpful to reduce the variance of the estimator uh, in some particular cases. So that's a different estimator that you could use uh, as well. Okay, those are two estimators, particularly the Horvitz Thompson estimator is one of the most uh, often uh, used estimators in uh, survey sampling. Okay. For each estimator, theta hat, Horvitz Thompson, Hadjik Brewer, or any other thing that I can come up with. I could define some properties within this framework of inference. So I'm going to be interested in properties such as the expected value of that estimator. And I'm denoting it here as E under P, the expectation under P, meaning that this is the expectation under the design based approach. You could also obtain a different expectation under the model based approach. The other framework of inference that you're going to be dealing with next week. But in this case, what I'm doing is an estimate is, is an expectation with respect exclusively to the sampling design. How is that defined? So if I take one sample, let's say S, 
I'm going to be able to calculate an estimator of my parameter theta, and I'm calling that theta hat s. Okay? Now, uh, that sample is associated with a probability, which is p of s. That's how likely I am to select that particular sample. So the expectation of the estimator is just the sum over all possible samples of the value that I would say is my estimate, have I observed that sample, times the probability of observing that particular sample. So basically what I'm doing in that case with the expectation is I want to know when I select one sample, I can provide one estimate, 15. If my sample is different, the estimate is going to be 17 or 12 or 14. On average, where am I going to? And if all the samples have the same probability, then I could just take all those values and calculate the average. But if some samples are more likely to be selected than other ones, then this quantity P of S starts mattering. Okay, so the expectation is just going to tell me, on average, where am I pointing towards? Where is my estimated uh, pointing towards? Okay, so can you imagine what I would like the expectation of my estimation to be, my estimator to be? Can you suggest? What do you think it should be, ideally? No? Okay, so I would imagine that if my estimator is a good estimator and my true parameter is theta, then in one sample, I may have something slightly larger than theta. In another sample, something slightly smaller than theta. But I expect that on average, my estimator would give me theta. So a good estimator is an estimator that has expected value of theta hat equal to theta. That's called an unbiased estimator. It, may, it doesn't mean that in every single sample I get the right value. But it means that on average, over all the possible samples that I could select, I would get a, the true value of the parameter. Okay, so I can define that properly. I can talk about expectation under this framework of inference. I can define the bias. So if I'm in an unlikely situation where my estimator is not unbiased, then I want to know how far from that true value of the parameter I am. Am I always above? Am I always below? How am I? How am I, work, how am I doing in terms of that? So this B is going to be defining the bias, the difference between the point that I'm aiming to and the true value of the parameter that I wanted to, to have. Of course, an unbiased estimator, we have bias equal to zero. Which other properties I can define? I can define the variance of an estimator. And then this variance of this estimator is going to be related to uh, how disperse the values that I can obtain across samples are. So it's possible that in one sample I obtain 12, and in another one 15, and in another one 30, and in another one 5. So that tells me how variable the estimates uh, are going to be. So I calculate the distances between the estimate that I observe with sample, let's say, let's say S, and the expected value, the average of all the, the possible samples. If my estimator has a small variance, and then I'm going to calculate an average that is weighted for, again for those probabilities of the samples. If all the samples have the same probability of being selected, then this is just an average, a simple average. I use this square to avoid, for example, uh, to, to avoid the, the, the signs cancelling. If sometimes I'm up above and sometimes I'm below, then I don't want that variance to be zero. So I'm going to square them to be able to sum all those different uh, distances. So an estimator that has a large variance is not necessarily a good estimator, is not a, very, not a very good estimator, because it's an estimator where in a given sample S, I may have a value that is actually very far from, in particular, the expected value, but if the main estimator is unbiased, it's actually quite far from the true value of the parameter. So I would prefer estimators that have small variance. Okay? Um, now, small variance if they are unbiased. Okay, because then I'm going to be close to the value of the parameter. Now, what happens if my estimator has a bias? If my estimator has a bias, then this quantity variance starts being much less relevant because I don't care if I'm always very, very close to the same point, but that point is very far away from the true value of the parameter. So imagine that I'm trying to estimate the proportion of people in poor, that is poor and the true proportion is 0.2 and my estimator is very 
has a very small variance. It always tells me 4, 3.5, 4.1. It's, it's too far away. It's too biased. They, they don't care if it has a small variance when it has a large bias. So to take those two things into consideration, what I consider, is, what I use is the mean square error. And the mean square error, now consider the distances, you see not respect to the expected value of the estimator, but respect to the true value of the parameter, how far I am from where I should be. Okay, so that is the mean square error. Uh, all of these quantities are weighted by P of S, because as I was telling you, the only thing that is random under this a framework of inference is the sample that I select. So that's why the only thing that I need to take into consideration here is the probability of that particular sample being selected. Okay, so if you have the true population, the entire population, if you take the census, for instance, and you want to see how well a particular sampling design and a particular estimator performs, then you can calculate all these quantities. You can just decide on a sampling design and select samples randomly, in each one of them, calculate the value of the parameter, see how likely that sample is to appear, and then obtain approximations of each one of these quantities to see how good a sampling design is, okay? And how good an estimator uh, is. That combination, sampling design plus estimator, is called a strategy. So you assess the strategies before you actually select the sample and go in the field. You decide which estimator and which sampling design is the one that you're going to go uh, with on the basis of those two things, on the, th on the basis of bias and on the basis of variance. So you consider things like the mean square error. Okay. We are looking for a strategy, which is, as I just said, a combination of sampling design and estimator that has as small as possible mean square error. If I'm using an unbiased estimator, which is often the case under this approach, or an almost unbiased estimator, then the variance is considered instead just because there is no difference between theta and the expected value of theta. Okay? Is this bit clear? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Now, um, uh, if, if this was a course of survey sampling, then I would have started defining a bunch of survey sampling designs and then a bunch of estimators, and then we would sit and do the calculations to find out how each one of the estimators looks under that particular sampling design. So you see, a different sampling design is going to give me a different set of PKs. So the shape of this is going to be different depending on the sampling design. And you can do the calculation. You do that in your course of survey sampling. You basically, you develop all the basic estimators and all the basic sampling designs and all the variances of them and the variance estimators and so on. That's what you do. Here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a couple of results just to try to make sure that you understand how it works. OK, so the first and simplest sampling design and estimator that I can think about is the simple random sampling estimator, this strategy of simple random sampling uh, together with the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total. OK, so simple random sampling is just the same thing that you would you can imagine is the simplest uh, in a sampling design. It would be equivalent to what you did if you, for example, uh, gave every person in the population one number and you selected randomly a given set of numbers n numbers and of a small n of those numbers. So imagine that you put uh, you create one piece of paper for each one of them with their number. You put them in a bag, blah, 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 blah. You mix and you select one, two, three, bam, without putting the names back in the back, without replacement. That is what you would do if you do simple random sampling. So, of course, in that case, everybody has the same probability of, be, of being selected, and every given sample of size n has the, exactly the same probability. P of s is actually constant. So, under this sampling design, P of s is constant and is given by this quantity. I'm going to have n combined n. A possible samples is basically how many in how many different ways can I choose n units when I have capital N units. That's going to give me how many samples belong to that big capital S, the sample space. And then because all of them have exactly the same weight, then this is just one over that quantity is going to be P of S. That is true if S is of size N, zero otherwise, because I decided that I wanted to select N particular um, particularly in uh, um, units. Given that P of S, then how is the inclusion probability? The inclusion probability, I said it was defined as the sum of the probabilities of selecting each one of those samples, but I'm only counting the samples 
that contain element K. Now, how many samples contain K? Well, if I fix, think about probability, your course of probability, I fix one element that has to be there, then I have N minus one in the population to choose N minus one for my sample. So this is the number of samples that contain element K. And one over N divided by N was P of S. I do the calculation here and it, I obtain that the inclusion probability under the sampling design is just small n divided by capital N. Is again, is the same for all elements in the population. So given this inclusion probability, how is the horvitz thompson estimator? So I say that the horvitz thompson estimator was the sum over the sample of the observations divided by their corresponding inclusion probabilities. But that inclusion probability is common for everyone. So I can just take it out of the sum is going to get out as capital N divided by N because it was in the denominator. And then here I have the sum of S of YK. So that's that's the form of that um, a horvitz thompson estimator in the case of simple random sampling. Now, let me let me use it once. Let me build uh, just a toy example to illustrate some things here. So imagine that I have a population that has only four elements, elements one, two, three, four. I'm going to select a sample of size three and the values that are associated with each one of those four elements are three, seven, two, and eight. Those are the true values in the population that I wouldn't be able to see, okay? Because I'm using four, uh, selecting three among four elements, then my inclusion probabilities are going to be three, four, three divided by four, and this quantity, the expansion factor one over P by K is 1.33, okay? Now, what are all the possible samples? So if I have four elements and I'm selecting three, then I have only these four possible samples. In the first case, I do not select individual one. In the second case, I do not select individual two. I do not select individual three, or I do not select individual four. Those are, those are all the possible samples with this very uh, small example. For each one of those samples, I know that the probability is the same, is n over n, is three over four. Okay, sorry, is one over uh, the combinatorial between n and n. Now, as all of them are exactly the same, I don't really need to use p of s. I can just calculate the average when I want to do things like expectation of variance. So now let me obtain uh, the horvitz thompson estimator for each one of those samples. So if my sample was conformed by units 2, 3, and 4, then that means that the y's that I see are 7, 2, and 8. So I'm going to calculate the sum of those three elements. 7, 2, and 8, that gives me 17. And then I'm going to multiply by that expansion factor that I know that is 4 divided by 3. And then multiplying 17 times 1.33, I get 22.6. That is the horvitz thompson estimator if the sample that I obtained was 2, 3, 4. If the sample that I obtained was 1, 3, 4, then I observe units with values 3, 2, and 8. And now my estimate of my, my sum is 13 and my estimate is 17.33 and so on. So you can obtain the values of the horvitz thompson estimator under each one of all possible samples. In this case, it's pretty straightforward because I only have four elements. And then I could use those definitions that I made a moment ago about the expectation and the variance to see what is the expected value and what is the variance of this strategy. So let me start by the expected value of that horvitz thompson estimator in this case, because all of them have the same probability of S, I just need to calculate the average. I'm going to take the values of the horvitz thompson estimator for each one of those samples, and I'm going to calculate the average between those four values. You can do it at home. If you take those four values and you calculate the average, then the average is 20, which is exactly the same as 3 plus 7 plus 2 plus 8. So the horvitz thompson estimator is unbiased. My expected value, expected value of that estimator is exactly the same as the value of the parameter that I'm trying to estimate. And that is true for any sampling design. That is true for simple random sampling, but it's true for any other sampling design. As long as you're building the horvitz thompson estimator with the right PKs, the ones that reflect the sample design that you used, then your estimator is always unbiased. OK, I could also be interested in looking at the variance of that horvitz thompson estimator. And I say that I was going to look for the variance at the differences between the horvitz thompson estimator 
when I select sample S and the true, but here is the true value of the parameter just because it's, the estimator is unbiased, is the expected value is, is equal to T. And I'm going to take those quantities and I'm going to square them and I'm just going to just gonna calculate the average. Another way to write that that is specific to simple random sampling is this way. Both ways are equivalent in this case. So what I'm doing is calculating 22.6 minus 20, I, ele I elevate at the power of 2, and then 17.33 minus 20 at the power of 2, and then I take the average of those four values. And my variance, the true variance of my estimator is 11.55, okay? Pretty straightforward. You're going to do this in the computer workshop, but you're not going to do it by hand. We're going to use a package that does it for you, okay? So it's, this is why I wanted to do it once, because in practice now you're not, gonna, you're not really going to do it by hand ever. So it's good to do it at least once. Okay, now let me change slightly the sampling design. Let me keep working with the same population of four units, which exactly the same values of Y, but now I'm going to select a sample of size one. If my sample is of size one, then my expansion factor N over N is going to be four. Before it was 1.33, now it's going to be four. Of course, if I have only one observation, then that observation has to wait much more in order to represent all the observations of the universe, of the population. So what are the possible samples that I can have if I select only one unit? Then I either select the first one or the second one or the third one or the fourth. If I selected the first one, then what I saw was three. If I selected the second one, it was seven and so on. Now I'm going to multiply that quantity by the expansion factor. So three times four is going to give me 12. 7 times 4 is going to give me 28, and so on. And I'm going to do the same thing of trying to obtain the expected value and the variance. The only thing that I have changed is the sample size. The expected value is, again, going to be the average of the values of the Horvitz-Thompson estimator across all possible samples. So it's going to be the average between 20, uh, 12, 28, 8, and 32. You can do the count. We again obtain 12, 20. We again obtain the true value of the parameter. That happens because the horvitz thompson estimator, as I said, it, is unbiased regardless of not only the sampling size, the sample size, but the sampling designs as long as the by case are correct. The ones that you're using are the right ones. Now, what about the variance? Now I'm going to consider the differences between these quantities and 20 elevated at the power of 2, and then I'm going to take the average. If I do that count, now is 104. Before, it was... 11.55. Now it's 104. Um, in the previous case, I could calculate the coefficient of variation just to have an idea of 104 is large, 104 is small. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to take the variance of the Horvitz Thompson estimator and I'm going to divide it by, I'm going to take the square root and then I'm going to divide by the true value of the parameter. That's what I'm going to define as coefficient of variation. Okay. And uh, I'm going to compare the coefficient of variations of those two sampling strategies. So if I select three of them, my coefficient of variation is 17%. If I select one only, the coefficient of variation jumps to 0 0.51. Um, uh, Santiago, Santiago, you wanted to say something? Yeah, yes, but I think that the with the last thing that you said, uh, I get more, more clear about that. But my comment is about, um, I, I understand that the expected value of uh, any any sample is the same uh, because the, that estimator is unbiased, but the, the main point here is the variance, right? So we can estimate whatever we want, but by construction, this estimator is unbiased. However, according to the number of the sample, of the elements in the sample, we are going to obtain a different variance. And, and that's that variance that we have to, to pay attention to choose what is our best sample. Yes, so basically there is a, there is a relationship, uh, which is imagine that you, you could select a sample that all the elements. What do you think would be the variance of if you included all the elements? 
if your uh, sample size small n was capital N. Zero? Uh, can you repeat because that, please? Because you have uh, only one sample. You see the ball. I, uh, I have a, a very slow internet. Can you repeat the last part, please? Yes, no, I'm saying if, if you think about, let, let's play with the sample size, okay? So if you were able to select as a sample the entire population, if a small n, this a small n was exactly the same as the population size, then you only have one sample. That is the whole population. There is only one value of your estimator, the true value of the parameter. There is no variance. So the variance in that case would be zero. When you select this, when you increase the sample size, there is a relationship that tells us that for the same parameter, for the same estimator, for the same sampling design, when you increase the sample size, the variance goes to zero. Okay, so starting with one is going to have a larger sample size of one, it's going to have a larger variance that sample size of two, larger than three, and clearly larger than four, which in this case would give me a variance of zero. So yes, there is that relationship. Larger sample size implies smaller variance. Yes? Yes, yes, I got it. Okay. Now you are very right in the sense that, but what about the expectation and the, I do do I care exclusively about the variance? So the issue is that we would like to have samples that are as large as possible, but we cannot have an infinite budget. So what we're trying to do is to find what is the sampling design and the estimator, the combination of those two things, and the sample size that we can afford so that we can obtain the best possible estimator in the sense of being unbiased if possible and with a smaller variance for a given budget that we have. Okay? I'm going to talk about other different sampling designs there. Because here, sample size seem, seems to be the only thing that affects the cost. But in practice, it's not exclusively sample size the only thing that affects uh, the cost. But yes, the idea is we want to select a sample size. We want to identify a sample size that is as large as we can pay for it so that the variance of the estimator is smaller. Right? Okay, okay. Thank you. Now, this is something that I find is kind of counterintuitive when you come from a different background. This is why I wanted to tell, talk about this with you guys because you guys are economists. If I were to select a sample of the size of the population, this framework of inference tells me the variance is zero. If you come from something like the model-based framework of inference where Y is random, then even if you see the whole population, there is going to be variance there because you assume that the Y that you observe is one of many possible Ys that could have been generated under the model that generates Y. So if I say y comes from a normal distribution, okay, then the y that I see is just one y of many possible y's. So even if I see the entire population, there is a still variance there. In the case of the design-based framework of inference, I assume that if I see them all, I'm done. There is no job for a statistician in that context, okay? If I if I could see them all, there is no randomness. There was no no point in making any kind of inference. The variance is the variance is zero and under this specific uh, framework of inference, okay? That was one thing that I wanted to, to point out. The other thing is, okay, when we talk about the sample size and the variance, is different when we talk about uh, large sample sizes, when we're talking, for example, about estimating something at the national level or department level, gr great groups of, of population, or when we talk about small domains. Why? If you look here in the last sentence that I'm trying to see here, okay, I can talk about the variance, 104 in one case and 11 in the other one, I can say, yeah, the coefficient of variation is much larger. But in practice, the main implication to me of this um, situation of that variance is that I really don't care much about an estimator being unbiased when it has a large variance. Why I don't care about that? because I don't care if the estimator behaves very well on average because I only get to see one sample, you see? So in the case where I selected three units, I could have seen one of four possible values, either 16 or 24 or 17.33 or 22.6. If I consider those four to be close enough 
as to say, yeah, any of those would have been plausible for the actual value of the parameter, which was 20, then that's fine. But if my estimator has a very large variance like this one, then the possible values that I could have observed are 32 if I got this sample, 8 if I got this sample. So is 8 an acceptable estimator? Because life happens once. I only select one sample. I just see one of them. I don't see the four of them. You see, so when the estimator has a large variance, I have a, a higher likelihood of getting an estimate that is very extreme. And that's not ideal because I don't have the chance of repeating the whole exercise and getting another one. I only see that one because I have only one sample. OK, so that is a problem in general, but it's a problem that is um, having that wide difference is problematic in general. But it's even more problematic in the case of domain estimation because you have a small sample sizes and then you're going to have estimators that have very large variance and therefore more likely you're more likely to see um, extreme values of that estimator that may be very far away from the true value of the parameter. OK. It's not only the coefficient of variation. It's how likely am I to see something that is actually implausible in a way or, or useless in practical, in practical in, in that sense. OK, is this a bit clear? Yeah, yeah, it was very clear. Thank you. No, thanks to you. OK, so that is one possible sampling design. Uh, uh, now I'm going to talk about other sampling design. I'm talking about two stage PPS SRS. So in the case of service, uh, simple random sampling, I say I take, let's say, all the elements in the population. I put a number on each one of them and I select a set of n numbers without replacing. Two stage goes from a different perspective. So in the case of two stage, I assume that I have the same population n capital N elements in that population, but I have them grouped. There are groups of units, so I'm going to have, let's say, N1 capital N1 groups of units. Each of those groups is one U1, U2, U3. UI, the group I has size NI, so it's a partition of the population in the sense that if I take all those groups and I put them together, then I have the population again. And if I take all the sample sizes of each one of, of the population sizes of each one of those groups and I sum them, then I, I go back to the population. It's a partition of the population. OK. <coughs> simple example of this. So imagine that you take instead of taking a sample in the case of simple random sample, we would select a sample of individuals in Colombia. In this case, I assume that the individuals are grouped, for example, depending on the municipality and where they live. And what I'm going to select is municipalities. So each one of those UIs is one particular municipality that has size and I. OK, I'm going to go in this case, PS2 stage. I'm going to select two samples. In the first stage, I select a sample of primary sampling units. So if my groups are municipalities, I start by selecting a sample of municipalities. I'm going to call it S1 to indicate that is the first stage. And that S1 is clearly contained on the population of first stage units. So I select a sample, a sample of municipalities using PPS design, uh, which is a design that gives me inclusion probabilities that are not like in the case of simple random sampling constant for everybody, but that change. They are inclusion probabilities that are proportional to something. That's what the PPS sampling designs do. In this case, I'm going to give more probability of being selected to larger municipalities. So I'm going to use an inclusion probability that is proportional to the ratio between the size of that particular municipality and the overall size of the population. OK, those are going to be inclusion probabilities that I'm going to use. That's how I select the sample of the first stage. Now, once I have selected the sample of the first stage, I'm going to go to the second stage. And for each one of those municipalities that I selected, now I'm going to select a sample of elements. Now I'm going to select people. N elements, um, I'm going to select a sample of uh, NI. Sorry, this should be NI. NI elements, SI contained within that municipality, UI. And I'm going to use, in this case, simple random sampling. So the first stage, I used unequal probabilities of inclusion proportional to this quantity in the second stage. I do what I did in the previous example. I just put everybody that lives in that municipality, all the numbers in one bag, and I select 
ni of them. The whole sample, the overall sample, is just going to be the union of all the samples in each one of the municipalities that were selected in the first stage. The inclusion probability, now it has to take into account that actually I played the game of selecting randomly twice. So the inclusion probability is the product of those two inclusion probabilities, PI1I, which is the probability that municipality I had to be selected, which was proportional to this, and PK given I is the probability of individual K being selected given that municipality I was selected, which is going to be a NI in general divided by NI, assuming that NI is the sample the size that I observe in that municipality. Okay, now I'm, I'm, I have put here N instead of an I because I'm using and um, um, in this approach, if I set N, the same number of elements in each one of the municipalities, the, one, the, the number of elements that I select in each municipality is the same, then this design has the property of being self-weighted. Okay, so what does that mean? When I selected the first stage, people that lived in bigger municipalities was more likely to be selected than people that lived in smaller municipalities. Now, in the second stage, I basically selected in every municipality, I just selected 30 people. I don't care if that's Bogota or if that's Medellin or if that is Florencia. Everybody, everywhere, I'm just going to select 30 elements, exactly the same N. And then when I obtain the inclusion probabilities, you see that this NI cancels with this NI, and I end up without doing it uh, with, with a simple random sampling, but I end up with an expansion factor, an inclusion probability and an expansion factor that are the same for all the elements. Why is that desirable? This is a particular sampling design that you find a lot uh, applied uh, by agencies, for example, that uh, collect data on demographic outcomes and things like that, where you're going to have many secondary data users. So if you have many secondary data users and you don't want to border, put burden in everyone uh, on having to use the sampling weights to calculate things whenever you know that your data is going to be used to do regression models and things like that, and that everybody's going to have to keep in mind this, the expansion factors, then if you propose a design in this way, people can kind of be cool about using this, the expansion factors because the final inclusion probabilities are constant for everybody. So this is a design that is, is extremely convenient in terms of uh, analysis, a self-weighted uh, design. <clears throat> okay, I don't think I don't think Danny has any self-weighted designs. Do you know anything about that? Does anybody know anything about that? Let's let me make me, let me make a simple question. Something like the design, the sampling design of the Hey Yachi, for example. Can anybody tell me more or less how it looks like? Do you know how it looks like? Uh, I think that the words that the query words are uh, stratify, conglomerates, um, multi-stage sampling. I, I think that the, that, that are the the three words of 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 hey, yes. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Yes, you I'm sure that's. Yeah, the, I'm, I'm going to talk about stratification in a moment, but yes, I'm sure that's that's the case. So multi-stage. Why do we select multi multi-stage samples? We select multi-stage samples because if I wanted to select a simple random sample, I need to have a list of all the elements in the population to be able to select the n elements directly. But Colombia doesn't have a list of all the members of the population. Colombia doesn't have a list of households of the entire country. So you cannot just simply go and select people or select households straight away. So we select something for which we have a list, for example, municipalities, for example, enumeration areas from the census, for example, departments. OK, and then that that in, in, in one of the reasons is because we don't have what is called sampling frames for those units directly. The other reason is because of cost. I mentioned cost before. Now I can talk a little bit about that. If I have to select a sample of elements, people directly, household directly, and I have to go and visit them, 
then that means that I'm going to have to go up, down, and center through the whole country if I select a simple random sample. Whereas if I select a two-stage sampling design, then I select, let's say, 25 municipalities in the first stage, and I only am going to have to send uh, teams in the field to collect data on those 25 municipalities. I don't have to go up and down and center the whole country. So in terms of cost, that is much more efficient uh, uh, than uh, doing um, a simple random sample. The fact that it's less costly means that I can have a larger sample size than the one that I would have if I have to pay for going to collect the data in each one of the of the places of uh, of the country. So that's the reason. If the HEH is multi-stage, then that just means that we play this game many times. So for example, that you select municipalities and inside the municipality, you select like a block of buildings, for example, and then within that block of buildings, you can select households and then you keep everybody in the household, for example. That would be a three-stage sampling design. Okay, I'm going to talk about the stratification in a moment, but that's that's the general idea. Now, I don't think Danny has this game with the sample sizes in order to induce self-weight. It's hardly efficient in terms of variance. It's just extremely convenient for analysis purposes. So for that, I probably this is not so relevant. But if you're going to use things like the demographic and health survey, for, for instance, which is available in most developing countries, then those sampling designs, they collect the data, but they know that the actual users of the, of the data are much more broader than them. So they try to do a sampling design that is easy to analyze. In case you have weighted designs, much more are much more common. Tell me, Antiago. Uh, Angela, just a small question about the first stage and the second stage, just for clarify. So you say that in the second stage uh, we can select a sample and. Uh, in each municipality with the same uh, with the same number of elements, for example, 30. So uh, if we select from every municipality, 30 persons. But this is because we internalize the the way the, the selected sample that is weighted in the first stage. So I, I mean, in the first stage, we weight the population and we a uh, give some shares or or or, or weights uh, according to the number of people that is in each municipality so we wait that but in the second stage we we choose the, the the same number of population this is because we waited before and we internalized the process that we did in the first stage so in the second stage we can do do that okay so that would there are several things about that the first thing is that in the case, in the general case of multi-stage sampling designs or even two-stage sampling design, a multi-stage or a two-stage sampling design only says, I select one unit PSUs in the first stage with whatever sampling design. It could be simple random sampling as well. It could be PPS. It could be something else. And then I select within each one of those PSUs, I select a sample of units or a sample of secondary sampling units, and then they keep going. There is no um, restriction in terms of which sampling design do you have to use in each stage. There is no restriction about how you decide the sample size in each one of those stages. So, for example, you could do two stage simple random sampling, simple random sampling. Nobody's saying that that is not possible. OK, now doing probability proportional to size is useful because it gives you lower variance for things like totals. So imagine that this is not household service, but imagine that this is business service, for example, okay? So if you're going to select companies and you want to estimate turnover, you want the companies that have the largest turnover in your sample. Those are the ones that you need to measure quite efficiently if you want to have an estimator with a small variance. If you have sample where sometimes you have the biggest companies and sometimes you don't have them, then the variance of the estimator is going to be extremely large. So there are many reasons why you choose either simple random sampling or PPS or why you choose a, a different sample size a, within the PSUs as well. OK, so there is no restriction. And indeed, for example, a survey like a like a HEIACHI, 
I'm sure they don't use the net necessarily the same amount of individuals within each one of the PSUs. OK, they don't they don't do it. I'm sure they don't do it. This thing that I'm showing you is just a trick is literally a trick just to induce a design that is going to be simpler to analyze by secondary users. It doesn't mean that is the most efficient sampling design. Probably you could find a way of distribute the sample size in the second stage that was better in terms of giving you a smaller variance, but that is going to force secondary users to have to use those weights whenever they analyze it. So this is just this is just a matter of, of convenience whenever you know that your main users of the data are going to be people that is secondary users of the data. It's not going to be the National Statistical Office. OK, now the thing that the way how you formulated the question leads me to think that you're thinking on something like uh, representative samples. Is that what you have in mind? Yes, yes. Like that the sample should be a small version of the population. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's the thing. That's not true. That's not necessarily true. And actually, sometimes we induce in the sampling design, we induce very work, very, very rough uh, distributions of probability that do not reflect the distributions of the, prob of the probabilities of those populations in the, in, the, in the real population because it's more efficient. So sometimes, for example, let me bring you back to the, to the case of business surveys. You can know that the biggest surveys, the biggest companies, uh, sorry, are just five companies. But you you create a sampling design where they're always in there. That doesn't really reflect the structure of the population. That sample will never reflect the true structure of the population. But we do it because that is more efficient in terms of variance estimation. Now, how, how is it that that doesn't create bias? How is that that is not problematic? It's not problematic because you give them a large probability but then you don't weight them here when you use the inclusion probability. So if you were messing up with the distribution of groups in the population and not using the expansion factor, you're in trouble. But as long as you use the correct expansion factor, you're going to be unbiased. See what I mean? Is something that is uh, it's uh, it's actually quite common for people to think that that if you select a sample, that the structure of the sample, the distribution by age and sex, and the distribution by economic level, and the distribution I don't know in terms of uh, the region they come from, should be like a mini universe reflecting those distributions in the population, and that would make analysis simple, but it's not necessarily. The most efficient thing. So sometimes in the design stage, you actually mess up with all those distributions on purpose just to obtain an estimator that has a smaller uh, variance. Now, that does, doesn't create bias as long as you use an estimator like the Horvitz Thompson, which downweights the people that you have given extra weight on purpose. Okay? Go on, Jose, tell me. Yes, uh, I have two questions. Um... The first one is uh, how, in, in terms of this, how I how I could interpret interpret it when this uh, when I have a, a expansion factor that are not uh, the same number because in some in some places I have heard that when when the, when we should. Uh, it is recommended or we should have an expansion factor that doesn't variate, that doesn't have many, many difference between between the units. Yeah. Um, but in some in some cases we have expansion factors that, that are not the same number, that, that differs in some in some cases. And the second question is, uh, if not self self weighted expansion factors, what are, what are the other types? Uh, I think hey I, I I have the, the the methodological document and they say they use a, a, a span, basic expansion factor subsample weight and adjustment for for undercover for undercovering and then they they calculate a final expansion factor 
what, what, which, do, what expansion factor type do you believe the HIH could be using? Okay, thank, thank you so much. Yes, okay, so uh, going back to that, but I mean, um, why would we like to the, for the expansion factors not to vary much? Again, if you're in a household survey, vary much. But if you're in something like bigger surveys, you can make them vary a lot on purpose, just because that is more efficient in terms of variance estimation. And that is some of the business service it has. You're going to see that expansion factors may be very, very, very large for some companies and tiny for another for other for other sets of companies. As long as you use the correct expansion factor, you're fine. If you just take the observations in the sample, imagine, for example, let me let me try to build a, uh, an example that is going to be illustrative. OK, so imagine that you have a population in which 20 percent of the people are women and 80 percent of the people are men. OK, if I select a sample using simple random sampling, I probably going to see 20 percent of women and 80 percent of men. If I select a sample on purpose where, for example, women have three times as much probability of being selected than men, then I may end up with a sample with a set of samples where the distribution of female male in the sample is completely different from the distribution of the female male in the population. OK, why would I want to do that? So imagine, for example, that if women are a rare group, giving them extra weight may be the only chance that I have to actually see any. OK, that's one reason. If the, if, if the people from that particular group of population is very rare and you expect them to come out just when you select the sample like that, they may you, you may end up with no one. So sometimes you change on purpose the weights, you change on purpose the probabilities to give the, that people a chance of showing up in your sample. Otherwise, you may end up with a sample in those in those groups of population. Or when the things that you're measuring are very skewed. So in the case of household surveys, that doesn't really it doesn't really work like that because things may be slightly skewed, but they're never extremely skewed. If you talk about business surveys, income or turnover, production, they can be extremely skewed. And then in those cases, making sure that the biggest companies are in your sample on purpose is extremely efficient for you to have an estimator that has a small variance. So if people say that, uh, that expansion factors shouldn't vary much, that is not necessarily true. It is true that in survey, in surveys, household surveys, they tend not to vary much, but basically because you have no reason to vary them much. Unless you were in a situation like that where you have a very rare group of population that you can identify in advance and giving them a bit of an extra weight, you just don't have a reason to make the weights very, very different to start with. But having very different uh, expansion factors is not a problem as long as you know what to do with them. Now, if you forget that distortion that you introduce and you just calculate a sample mean, then yes, you're in deep trouble. But as long as you know what are the true expansion factors and you use them correctly, you're fine. OK, thank you. Now about the HIH. Yes. The HIH. So the HIH is going to have a multi-stage sampling design. So that means that here when I this inclusion probability as the product of these two, they're going to have many more. So they're going to have a first stage a second stage, a third stage, I don't know what else. And then on top of that, this is what you go out when you when you have your clean design, when everything is perfect, but then you go out in the field and then you realize that there is a block of buildings that you thought that had 15 people living in, but they have 500 because they have developed two new towers. So you have to sort out things sometimes in the field. Sometimes you have to do an extra stage of selection there just because you cannot interview 500 flats, you know? You have to select a subsample of those flats and then uh, an extra stage shows up out of nowhere or because you have non-response and then you need to adjust for that give more weight to the people that responded so that you recover the the sample size that you that you wanted so those are adjustments for non-response we're going to see other types of estimators later on that modify the sampling weights in different ways okay so you basically have design sampling weights 
and you have final sampling rates. And in between those two things, a lot of adjustments can happen. Uh, the ones that you okay. use for processing are, of course, the ones assuming that all the processes have been done correctly would be just the final ones. Okay, and self-weighted sample uh, fa expansion factors are, I, I think that I have problems with, I don't know where to put the self-weight uh, uh, tag. We, we, all of the, we have been studying only self-weighted expansion factors or there are another types you have, you have mentioned? No, Se here I only mentioned the simple random sampling which is self-weighted because everybody has the same, so you actually can kind of can kind of disregard it in a way because everybody okay. has the same weight. The, the word the is same. Happens. See, okay. I think that I have been uh, not least not good with an internet connection, but uh, it is same. Like pesado igualmente. Yo estaba leyendo self self-weighted. No, it's not self-weighted. It is same weighted. Yes. No, it's called. Yeah, I understand what you mean, but no, it's called that. That the technical term is self-weighted, in the okay. sense that the sample doesn't need weights. It weights itself. <laughs> okay. But that's the okay. reason why it's called self-weighted. But yeah, the meaning is because the sample, the, the weights are the same. You don't. You can just forget about the weights, basically. That's the idea. But the term is self-weighted. The sample weights hits itself. It doesn't need of an extra variable of weights for you to do the analysis. Now, that is partially true. I mean, if you basically what it says is if you're going to take data from, from a particular, imagine that you're now fitting a regression model on data from a survey. You don't work for Dane, but you work for another uh, charity and uh, whatever, and you get data from that has been collected by Profamilia or by somebody else, and you get those you're going to fit a regression model. The question is, do you have to take the design into account? You don't have to take the design into account. So self-weighted designs are very useful because you really don't have to think much about the sampling design. Whereas if the probabilities were all messed up in the sampling design, then you would have to take into account those probabilities. Otherwise, what you would conclude would be very wrong. But as I say, that self-weighted designs, self designs are something that you're going to find more often when whoever collects the data is not necessarily the main user of the data, not for Danny. Things like the DHS survey, for example, the DHS program that generally in every country in the world, they select self-weighted data uh, sampling designs because the number of users that that stuff has is, is just enormous. So you don't want to have to explain to everyone how to calculate the estimates. They just do a sample design that is very easy to analyze, even if that is not the most efficient thing to do. Okay. okay, thank you. Uh, now I get it because yes. <laughs> Next to you. But it's not a it's not a it's not a requisite. You you can have the weights however you want. Now something that I wanted to point out about the P, the the page sampling design in general, it doesn't have to be PPS SRS, is that if the domain, the UI, the, the domains that are of interest are the same primary sampling units. Then if you select a sample like this, at the end of the day, you would only have data available for those domains that were selected in the sample. So in the case of AH, for instance, if you're interested on poverty estimates, the question was municipality, then if you want to produce poverty estimates at the municipality level, then you start already with not having any sample in a bunch of municipalities because the first thing that you selected was a sample of municipalities. Anybody that was not in that sample, you're not going to have a sample for that. Or have zero observations in those cases. Okay? So that's not really ideal for the case of uh, domain estimation, that the domains coincide with the PSUs. <coughs> Another example. So this is a simple one, stratified simple and sampling. So how does a stratified sampling design work? I have again a population U that has capital N observations, and I'm going to partition it again in groups of observations. I'm going to partition them now in U1, U capital H. And UH has size NH. I have the same situation where now um, the unit of all those strata gives me the universe, and the sum of all the sizes of all the strata gives me the population size. They are um, they are not overlapping in, in strata. Okay. 
Now, in the previous case, I was selecting a sample of PSUs. Here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to select a sample of elements in each strata. Independently, in each one of those strata, I select a sample of elements, let's call it SH, using, in this case, simple random sampling. I could use something else, but I'm going to use here simple random sampling with size and H. OK, so in the, the previous example, I took a sample of municipalities and then I selected people within each one of the selected municipalities. That was two stage. In the case of stratified sampling, I say, for example, my municipalities are strata, but I'm all of the strata. In each one of the municipalities, I'm going to select one sample of elements. I don't select the strata. All the strata are going to have data. Each one of them acts for the purpose of sampling design and for the purpose of estimation. Each one of them acts, acts like a universe, like a small universe. And I do things independently in each one of those uh, small universes. Now, the total sample that I'm going to observe is going to be the union of all the samples of all the strata. The inclusion probability, let's say element K, in the case of simple random sampling in each one of the strata, then it's just going to be given by, as before, n divided by n, but now they're going to be the n on that strata divided by the n of that, on that strata. And that is true for the people that belongs to that particular strata age. How do I build the Horvitz Thompson estimator in that case? When you do stratification, then it's like you have split the population into subpopulations, and each one of those subpopulations is separately, and then you add everything. So if I wanted to obtain the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total, I would obtain the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total in each one of the strata, and then I would sum them up. <laughs> if I want to obtain the variance of that Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total, I will obtain the variance of the Horvitz Thompson estimator of the total on each one of the strata, and then I would sum them up. Okay, I can do things because I split in subpopulations and I treat each one of those subpopulations in covariances. So I can just calculate things in each one of them and then add them up. Okay, why is this stratification important? Stratification is, is important because it increases. Uh, efficient. So the mechanism for people to do stratification in practice is because if you can build groups of observations like this, the strata, in a way so that in any given strata, the people is similar, then the variance of your estimator within the strata is going to be small, and then the sum of those variances is going to be small. Okay, so let me go back to the case of business service, which is the, the easiest one. So in the case of business service, imagine that you have all the possible business that develop a particular activity, the ones that have a massive turnover and the ones that have tiny turnover. And I'm going to build the strata so that the biggest two turnovers are in one strata, the medium size turnovers are in the second strata, and the smaller turnover in the third strata. Then I select a sample independently in each one of them. I get my three estimates and then I add them up. And for the variances, I'm going to see how much is the variance of the turnover in strata one, in strata two, and in strata three, and then I'm going to add those three things. That smaller variance than if I had just selected the same number of businesses from everywhere, because the variance in that case would compare rich, uh, large turnovers and very small turnovers. So stratification is mainly a way of increasing efficiency. The variance is much smaller if the variable of interest, yk, is homogeneous in each one of the strata. Now, that is useful for things like business service. Now, it uses for us for the estimation of domains. It's very useful when you can define a strata that are the domains of interest, because then you can make sure that you have sample in every domain of interest. And you could, in principle, give as many sample size as it would be required to obtain an estimate for that particular domain. OK, so imagine that I want municipal uh, estimations of poverty, poverty estimates at the municipality level. And imagine that I could select and say, you know what, this, the municipalities are strata 
So that means that I'm going to select a sample of households in each one of the municipalities. Now I don't have the problem of having municipalities without sample because I selected a sample in each one of those municipalities. And even more, if I had infinite money, I could allocate them size sure that just using this approach, design-based approach, I could have a good quality estimator in each one of those strata. So for us, for the estimation of domains, certification is important for that. When the domain is planned, then you, if you are able to declare those strata and allocate the, the relevant sample, then you're going to be in, an, in a much better starting point for the estimation of, uh, of domains. A big problem is that you need to identify the strata prior to selection. So you would have to know which uh, individuals belong to which strata before you select them, and you not always have that kind of information. That's that's the problem. <clears throat> Questions about this bit? Questions about, about stratification? No, everything is clear. OK, great. So I was saying um, uh, when we're going to estimate domains, certification is, is a tool that is used for the estimation of domains. And we're going to, if we can declare the domains as a strata, that's useful. And if we can allocate the sample size uh, that is necessary in each strata, then that would be great because we could just obtain the estimates directly. So how to allocate sample size in a stratified designs is a thing that is uh, of interest is something that is a, 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 an area of active research even nowadays. <clears throat> so the, the term that is uh, given to that, how do I decide how many units in each one of the strata is called sample allocation, sample size allocation. Why? Because normally you wouldn't have the chance of saying how much do I need in a strata one and how much do I need in a strata two. What you would say is I have money for a hundred. How do I distribute that? How do I allocate those hundred units to those strata? in the way that is best in terms of having uh, a smallest variance. And there are very, several ways. So the simplest way that we can think of is using proportional allocation. Proportional allocation says use in a allocate to as a sample size to strata H this quantity. So take the, the size of that strata. I have a thousand people living in there. Divided by the total size of the population. So my population is one million. So I have one over ten. If you had one over 10 of the population, allocate one for over 10 of the size. Basically, it's just allocate the, 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 the sample size proportional to the sizes of each one of those strata respect to the total of the population. Now, how good is that a, a proportional allocation? It seems very simple. It is optimal for estimating the total at the national level if the variances of y in each one of the strata are similar. If the variable that you're talking about has a similar variances within each one of the strata. Now, if the variances of y are very different across strata, then you see the only thing that you are controlling here is by the size of the strata. But if a strata may be smaller, but has much more variability, then you may need an even larger sampling size, sample size, even though the strata is smaller. So it's not only the size of the strata what matters. This would be optimal only if the variance doesn't matter. Now, if the variance matters, then you have something like the Neyman or optimal allocation, in which you see you're working on, again, this is a multiplication between the size of the strata and this is the standard error of y in the strata. So you're using those two quantities versus the sum of all those quantities over the population to allocate how much you are going to need in any particular strata. So if you have a strata that is very large, you may end up with a large sample size. Or if you have a strata that is very variable, then you're going to end up with a large sample size as well. That's uh, Neyman's uh, allocation. Of course, calculating this requires you knowing the variance of Y in the population that generally you don't know. So if you're planning the sampling design, you usually use things like census data, or previous surveys or things like that to try to get estimates of those SH to be able to do the allocation of the sample size. Now, at that, I think most of the stratification that 
doing household surveys involves things like regions or departments and uh, urban rural and things like that. I don't think you don't, you don't use the stratification at the, at the municipality level, for example. <clears throat> so I don't know what is what is exactly the stratification that is using the hey edge, but I think it has to be something like a region and maybe you classify municipalities by using something like um, an index of development to see like which one are like the, the main cities or intermediate cities and smaller cities. You can stratify using things like that. So that was name and allocation. We could also have a other two allocations that are extremely simple, which are the equal allocation and the square root allocation. The equal allocation is very straightforward. It just tells you if you want to select 100 units and you have 10 strata, then put 10 units in each strata. That's it. <laughs> just divide the sample size by the number of strata that you have and give the same sample size to everyone. And the root allocation uses the same idea, but uh, in that case, it uses something like the proportional allocation, but instead of using the actual sizes of the population, it uses the square root of the sizes of the population. Why is that helpful? Because whenever you look, I mentioned that the sample size, uh, when the sample size increases, the variance decreases. But the decrease on that variance is not linear. This is the shape of the decrease of that variance. So that is why the square root allocation is surprisingly, as simple as it looks like, is surprisingly very effective in, in many situations. Now, those two allocations, the equal allocation and the square root allocation, work well for the estimation of strata means. So if, now we're talking a bit about domains. If you don't want to estimate only the total at the whole population level, but you want to get estimated by strata, then those two allocations are actually quite good for the estimation of the means of the strata, but they may be suboptimal for the estimation of the total of the population. So now you start having competing needs. Normally a survey, you would expect it to give good estimates at the national level and also good estimates at the, let's say, domains. But it happens that the allocation that is the best for the national estimate is not necessarily the best for each, each one of the, of the simple domains that you have. So there are other types of allocations that make kind of combinations between trying to balance those two requirements. So uh, in particular, I like this one from Costa. It's a compromise, it's called a compromise allocation. It's very straightforward. You are going to take a value of K and you're going to make a linear combination between those two allocations. So you make a combination between the proportional allocation and the equal allocation. This one is good for the strata means. This one is good for the overall total. If you want a design that is good for the total and not so bad for the means, then you choose a large K. If you want something that is good for the domains and you also don't want to mess up too much the one of the total, then you choose a small K so that this weight is a large. Again, very simple, very straightforward, it's, and nevertheless, it works uh, quite well. There are many other methods developed for uh, allocation of sample sizes. I have given you some uh, more in the in the references towards the end of the presentation. Now, uh, in particular, uh, the problem with using stratification for the estimation of domains is that sometimes you have too many domains that are of interest. So you want to produce, let's say, estimates at regions level and department level and municipality levels. But you also want to produce estimates by gender, and you also want to produce the estimates that there are things that start crossing, you know, like you have domains defined by geography and you have domains that are thematic and you would like to combine those things. So um, it's a very good paper from uh, Paolo Sierri, the Italian guys, for using a allocation, for creating an allocation that works like if you were talking about a cross-classification cross table. So if you have to satisfy so many different types of domains, then this one is something that can help you kind of balance things around uh, to propose a sample size that is not perfect for any of the type of the domains that you're considering, but it doesn't do bad for any of them either. OK, that one I'm, I'm giving you the paper in the, in the reference. Uh, I was talking about sample allocation principally because that is the main design tool that we have. From, uh, from this um, framework of inference, from the design-based approach for uh, estimation of domains. 
when you have estimation of domains under this approach, basically you have to do two things. One, plan as much as you can before you send the sample to the field, and then use an estimator that uses auxiliary information to improve the estimation of the domains. In terms of design, what we do is this. We stratify as much as we can, and we distribute the sample size in the way that is as effective as possible. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to pass now to talk about estimation. So 